DHCP has one major job, and that's to hand out IP addresses and then take them back when they're not being used anymore. That way we don't run out of IP addresses. This is our DHCP server here. On the left, it's listing each one of our DHCP scopes. So we're going to be using this one. See, I named it NLE Lab. And then this is the actual network that we're going to be using. And then we'll go through these. We'll be able to see these leases. We'll be able to see the IP address, the name of the computer, the MAC address, and how these all work. And I'll give you some real examples along the way. So before we get into the server side, we need to understand what DHCP is doing, how we're getting IP addresses. But there's two general ways to get IP addresses. You can either get them from DHCP or you can assign them statically. If you assign them statically, what that means is you're actually manually going in and setting your IP address. So if you come down by your clock here, mine's this little globe with the XLR because I'm on a LAN right now, so I don't have any internet connection. But if I click on it, I can go to network and internet settings. I'll go to Ethernet, and I'll go over to my network and sharing center, and then I'm going to click on where it says Ethernet here. And then this is a general window. You can get to this window a couple different ways, but that's just the easiest way I find to get to it. We'll go to properties, and then we're working with IPv4. So we'll open this up. So this box with these settings here, what it's saying is it's obtaining the IP address automatically, so it's obtaining it using DHCP. So if I wanted to give myself a static IP address, I would click this option here, and then it would make me manually enter it. Another word for static is also called hard coding. So if someone says, just hard code your laptop to it, that's what they mean. They mean give yourself a static IP address. And here, I would actually have to give myself an IP address. So 52. And my sub mask. And then I would have to point my machine to my gateway. So my modem in my house or my router or my business. If you don't understand DNS yet, I'm going to cover that, but it's not going to hurt you in this lab. So you can understand DHCP without understanding DNS, but we'll go over that later. But if we look at these three options, so the IP address is the address that your machine is using or the printer or whatever you're IPing. Your subnet mask will touch base on, and then your default gateway is that modem or your router or whatever's sending you out to the internet, let's just say. One trick I do want to give you here, so if someone does give you an IP address and they say use this IP address for this printer or use this IP address for whatever device it is, and they only give you the IP address, so let's say they give you this 10.249.140.52, and they don't give you the subnet mask and they don't give you the gateway, what you could do to find this information is you could go onto another computer, you could print out a network page from an existing printer, and that would give you this information as well. So if you go onto another computer, I'm going to use my hotkey here so i just hold down my windows key and hit r to open up this run box in the bottom left and if i hit cmd and hit enter it'll give me my command prompt i'm going to use the command ip config and hit enter and this will give me my ethernet setting you can tell that in this box here where we are filling in our information this information is also over here so you would just match this so if they gave me this 10.249.140.52 and i need to know my subnet mask it's right here because i'm on another machine that's already working and then if i need to know my default gateway it's right here while we're in here because we're going to be talking about mac addresses an extension to this command ip config that gave us this information here is slash all so if i click this here i'm going to get more information but the one that i'm looking at is this physical address. So this is my MAC address right here. So if you ever need to find a MAC address, that's a good way to do it as well. And this is showing me my DHCP server, my DNS server, which I don't have set because I'm on the lab. My gateway would be here. And then this is some lease information. But I'll let you explore that now. Now that we've covered a little bit of static IPs, let's go over to the DHCP. So the dynamic side of how it works. And then we'll do some real examples over on the server. But I want you to have a good idea of how DHCP is actually working as a concept. So in this example, this is your home modem. So this is the same thing at your house. So at your house and at a business, it's going to work the same. The only difference is at your house, your modem is acting as your DHCP server, your switch, your router, your firewall. And in a business, we usually have servers or specific devices for each one of those roles. The reason is this little box here can handle all of that traffic inside your house. And it's usually only about a dozen devices, maybe a little bit more. When you get into a business setting and you have a couple hundred devices trying to talk and trying to do all these jobs, this little box would have a stroke and thing on it. So what we do is we break it all apart so that each device can handle that process. But we'll go over that stuff. But for this example, let's say I have a computer here. And I plug it in. So what it's going to do is it's going to reach out to my modem and it's going to ask for an IP address. My modem is going to respond and it's going to give it this IP address. So in this example, it's dot two. And then the same thing with this laptop here. If I were to connect it to the Wi-Fi, it's also going to reach out for an IP address and the modem's going to respond. And I'm going to get this dot three and then your phone, your smart TV, Alexa, whatever the case may be. So if I didn't have DHCP to do that job, every time that I plugged in a device, it wouldn't ask for an IP address and get one. I would actually have to go in like we did with those static, and I would have to set all of those values. So if someone came over to my house and asked me for my Wi-Fi password and they hooked up their laptop to my Wi-Fi, after they connected, their network wouldn't work until I went in to their computer and I actually gave it an IP address. So that's a beauty of DHCP. The other thing that DHCP is doing is if this person left my house, after a certain amount of time, the DHCP server would take this dot three back. And then if another person came over, it could reallocate that dot three to them. So without DHCP, I would have to keep track of all of the IP addresses that I've used in some kind of Excel database or maybe a pen and paper. And then as people left my house or left my network, I would have to make sure that I jot down that I'm no longer using dot three because eventually I would just run out of IP addresses. So we went over this home example here and this is our business example. And remember we have a DHCP server. So this isn't your modem. In this example, this server is actually only doing DHCP. So it's only handing out IP addresses, keeping track of them, and then taking them back when they're not being used. The same scenario here. So I have my computer. I hook it up to an office. It reaches out to this DHCP server. DHCP server gives it the IP address of dot 50. And if I connect my laptop onto the wireless, it'll give it an IP address and then more computers and so on. So let's get onto this server. We'll do some live examples, but first we got to get into the server. So in your company, you can have reporting tools or other tools that allow you to get into servers. I know Windows has a free organization tool. The most raw way to connect to a server is just to use your remote desktop connection. So you can open up start, just type remote here down at the bottom. 
and then click. So this is on every single Windows operating system. You can pull this up. So this is my DHCP server. I just created it for this lab really quickly. Now, if you're doing this at work, let's say they actually give you access to the DHCP server. You may have access to it and you may not. Even if you don't have access to it, I think it's really important that you see the server side. It's really going to cement how DHCP works into your head. And that'll allow you to identify when you're actually having a DHCP problem. Now, if you're at work, you're probably not going to use an IP address. You're going to use a host name. So when you ask them what the DHCP server is, they're probably going to tell you a host name like DHCP or DC01 or something along those lines. So if they do end up telling you a host name like DHCP01, you just type it in this box and you'll get the same result that we're about to do with using the IP address. Or it could be a domain controller, so DC01. And that would work the same as the example I'm about to give you. But I just loaded up this DHCP server, so we're just going to use the IP address, and we're going to go ahead and hit connect. We're going to get this box that's going to give us a warning. We don't have to worry about that right now. Just go ahead and hit yes whenever you see this. Now you're going to get another box that's going to ask you for credentials. Mine were pretty safe. That's why I didn't get the box. We'll just say username and password. When you sign in, this is what you're going to see by default. And this can look pretty intense. There's a lot of options here. It tells you some information about your server. But this is actually just a window that's opened up, so it's nothing crazy. So we can close this out, and it'll look a lot like Windows 10. And realistically, it is. It's just got a lot more roles and features to it. So if you want to get back to that screen that I just closed out of, by default, your server manager box is here. It's a fresh install of server 2019 standard. So this box will be here for you. Go ahead and just click on it and it'll open this box back up for you. Like I said, there's some info here. But realistically, for the start, this is where you live up here on the top right. You just click on tools here and then a box will open. You have your DNS, you have your DHCP, and a lot of other features here, but we're going to focus on our DHCP. So this is how you open it. We'll go ahead and expand it. So at the top, it says DHCP. And then underneath that, it says NOE DC01. So this is actually the name of my computer. So if I go down to start and I type this to get this PC, I'll right click it, no properties. You can see that my computer name is NOE DC01. So that's why I'm seeing this here. And then it says .network on Elm Street .local. So I own www.networkonelmstreet.com. But when I installed server, it asked me for my domain name. And when I put in network on Elm Street, it can only use so many characters. So it just cut off what it can't use. That's why I got this network on Elm STR .local. So that's why you're seeing this first line here. So if I expand this, I'm going to get my IPv4. We're not using IPv6. So if I click on IPv4, I'll get the same options over here as I do over on the left. Server options, I don't have anything configured. I don't want to get into that until we get deeper in the systems. But this is my scope here. So I actually have two scopes. One's down right now, so it's a 192 scope. But we're going to use this scope of 10.249.140. And I just named it NOE Lab. And if I click on the next option down, or if I'm up here, I can also click it over here on the top right. This is actually going to give me my scope. So this is my network, 10.249.140. And I started my scope at dot 50 and I'm ending my scope at 150. So that's going to give me 100 IP addresses. The option underneath it, address leases. So these are the leases that are actually being used out of those 100 IP addresses from the address pool above. So this is the IP address that it handed out. It handed out dot 50. This is the computer names. So this is actually the computer that I'm recording this on. This is the lease expiration. So when I plug this desktop in, it got this IP address. And remember, this IP address is dynamic. It's not static. So it's just letting me use this IP address. So it expires on 1129 at 1238. And that's eight days from now. Now, if this computer is still online in eight days. What it's going to do is the DHCP server will reach out to this computer and say, are you still there? And if it is still on it, it's still using the IP address. It'll just give it another eight days and then so on. This is telling me what type of IP address it is. It was handed out by DHCP. And then this unique identifier, this is actually my MAC address that we saw in that command prompt. So DHCP is actually linking my MAC address to this IP address for the lease duration. So my computer turns off and then it turns back on, my computer is going to reach out again and say, can I have an IP address? Well, DHCP already has an entry for this MAC address that is reaching out and asking for an IP address. DHCP says, yeah, I actually already have an IP in my list for you. So it reassigns this dot 50 to it. And we won't get into these settings over here again. There's going to be some granular things that you guys will see, but I want to give you that high level view before we dig in really deep. So let's get a real example of a computer reaching out and grabbing an IP address. So I have this laptop behind me and it doesn't have an IP. I don't have it plugged in just yet. So let me go ahead and plug it in and let's watch it grab an IP address and we'll see the information that it gets. Now we can see that we have dot 51 assigned by DHCP and we can see the computer name. So I just named this laptop NOE and then the service tag that was on it. And then the expiration date, so 1129 at 136, the type, and this is the MAC address here and this is how it's assigned. Now if I'm having some kind of IP problem, maybe I plug in another computer and it's saying it has a duplicate IP address, I can actually click on this to highlight it and I can right click it and then I can delete this reservation here. So now it's gone. This laptop will actually have to reach back out and grab that IP address. And then of course, automatically, if I turn this laptop off for eight days, after eight days, the DHCP server will reach out and say, are you still using this? It won't get a reply to it because the laptop's off, so it will delete this, and it will throw that dot .51 back into the, to be assigned to another device. Now the next option down is reservations. This one's pretty cool. So we have that pool of IP addresses from 50 to 150. I can actually make a reservation within that 50 to 150, and I can specify if a specific device comes onto the network. If it sees the MAC address, it'll actually assign it a specific IP within that pool. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll see the example. We'll use the same laptop, so I'll take that IP address away, and then we'll make a reservation, and then we'll watch it grab that address. So I have reservations highlighted here. We don't see anything on the right because I don't have any reservations. So I can right-click this. I can do new reservation. Reservation name. I'll just put laptop. Let's say I'll give it 100 because that's within that 50 to 150. I'll put in the MAC address here. And again, I got this MAC address from that ipconfig forward slash all. And then as a description, I'll just put it MK's laptop. You can leave this as both or you can select DHCP. I'm not going to go into boot key again. That's more in the system. So we'll just go ahead and hit add. Box will go blank, but it did add. So after I hit close, now I have my reservation here. Now I'm going to refresh that IP address on that laptop. We'll make sure it grabs it.
Now I did the IP refresh on that laptop by using ipconfig slash release and then ipconfig slash renew. So let's go up to these address leases again. Now we can see that we have another entry and we can see it's on this network and we got that 100. What I named it, which was laptop, the lease expiration. It never expires because it's a reservation. Type is none because I'm actually assigning it. This is that MAC address again. And then the description, which is MK's laptop. Now this is a reservation. So even if I turn this laptop off for 10 days, when I turn it back and it reaches back out to the DHCP server, it's going to grab this dot 100. And that's the nice part about reservation. So let's look at that in another example where we might use it. So a good example of setting a reservation might be a printer. So when I install a printer onto a computer, if it's a network printer, not a local printer using a USB, the printer needs an IP address to be able to talk on the network and to be able to talk to the computer to receive print jobs. So let's say it has .55. So if it uses DHCP and it gets assigned .55, and I go around the office and on 25 different computers, I install that printer as .55. And then let's say that printer goes down, like it doesn't have enough toner. So someone turns it off for eight or nine days until all of a sudden we get the shipment of toner or some scenario like that. That IP of .55 is going to go back into the pool. And let's say someone comes out with their laptop and they get .55. Once we turn this printer back on, it's going to grab a completely different IP address. So none of these computers here are going to be able to talk to that printer unless I re-IP that printer on every single computer as the new IP address. So one thing we could do is we could create a reservation of .55 for this printer by its MAC address. That way that every time it turns on, it gets that .55. Also making sure that if it's off for too long, nothing else is going to grab that .55. So if we move back over to the server here, remember that we have these reservation names and these descriptions. So the nice part about this is I can name this accounting printer. That way, if this user calls in and says, hey, I can't print for whatever reason, or there's a problem with the printer, and if I ask them what printer it is, they're going to say, I don't know, it's the printer over in the office that I print to. Now, good organizations will put a sticker on the printer with the IP address, or at least the name, so our reporting tool, we can look up the name of the printer. But if that wasn't the case, I could always say, what department do you work in? You say, I work in accounting. I can go into my reservations here, and I could look for the accounting printer in my reservations. So with these reservations, we can also stay organized and maybe stay proactive, too. So if you notice on that DCP scope, I only use 50 to 150. So our network is 10.249.140.0. And realistically, we could use 1.254, but I only use 50 to 150. So why is that? Well, I need some IP addresses, and I like them to be on both sides for specific things that I don't want it to have to rely on the DHCP server. So like my router, you'd say, well, why don't you just give it a reservation? Well, just like that laptop, if I turn it off and then I turn it back on, it reaches out to the DHCP server for an IP address. It sees that reservation, and it gives that laptop the IP address. So if that DHCP server goes down, when the laptop boots up, it reaches out for an IP address, even though it has a reservation. The DHCP server isn't on, or it's not responding, so that laptop's not going to get an IP address. It's not going to I don't want my router to have to rely on a DHCP server. So I give static IP addresses to all my network equipment. And when I pick those IP addresses, I want them to be outside of the range, either before or after. Now it's very common in the enterprise that your router will be 254, your switches will be 253, your server will be 251, 250, etc. Et I put a lot of my network equipment on the higher side. If you do an IP config on your computer at home, more than likely your router is dot one. That's really common for a service provider in a home environment. Your router will be one and then your first device. You'll probably have two or your TV is two or whatever the first device that came online. That's why we use these tighter ranges. That's why we don't use the entire range because I need those static IP addresses for certain things. And actually, in fact, we don't set reservations for our printers. We actually static our printers because we have reporting tools. I can look up the IP, I can look up the printer name or even the site and pick out the printers. So I don't need to rely on reservations, but also my printers don't have to rely on the DHCP server. So one last thing before we finish up on DHCP here. So if I have my DHCP server and it goes down in the middle of the day, these computers don't stop working because they already have their IP addresses. So they'll keep working and they won't know the difference. Now, if someone restarts their computer while the DHCP server is down, remember, it's going to boot back up. It's going to ask for that IP address. DHCP server isn't there, so it's not going to get an IP address and this user is going to have problems. Or if someone new came into the site and tried to plug in their laptop, they wouldn't be able to get an IP address and they would have problems. So if it goes down in the middle of the day, you'll start seeing these trickling in tickets of people saying, yeah, my computer's not working all of a sudden. And the DHCP server might actually be the issue. The problem that we run into is that the DHCP server goes down overnight. A lot of people turn their computers off at night. So when they boot up in the morning, we'll get this mass influx of tickets. And as long as we can see that our routers and our switches are up, then we start looking at DHCP and that's usually the issue. But also a lot of people don't shut their computers down. So usually the site is limping along. So we actually identify that's the DHCP server and have someone either turn it back on or figure out the issue. But if we go back to our server over here, and I right click on IPv4 here, there is an option to configure the failover. So we'll actually have two DHCP servers and one's gonna be the failover. So if this one does go down at night, this has an exact copy of what's on this one. And when this one goes down, it flips over and it knows to start grabbing IP addresses from this machine here. So that's a nice way to kind of cover ourselves. So I think we went over a lot in DHCP. I hope you guys understand the concepts behind it, how you can use DHCP as a tool if you do have access to it. So let's get ready for episode seven.